Well, welcome to everybody. I'm very pleased to be here. I think this is just an extraordinary event and I'm proud to be part of it. In all my years of teaching, I think this whole aspect of bow finishing is something that's really been neglected, uh, not because I wanted to neglect it, but because we simply run out of time at the end of a week or two weeks or months. It doesn't, it doesn't matter how long a person is studying. This fi the final aspects of finishing are so critically important to the aesthetic beauty and really the saleability of the bows but we never quite get there. My teachers only gave me basic information about what they had learned in France and, uh, and things have changed over the course of time. So we'll start on the next page and let's take a look at that picture on the left. In the brown bottle is nitric acid. It's called full strength nitric acid when in actuality it's 70% acid and 30% water. It's something to be taken very seriously because it can cause uh, burns to the skin. It's something you don't wanna be inhaling. So I always do it outside. I have safety glasses in the picture, which are just so important. Uh, you don't wanna be using uh, contact lenses underneath because the fumes can get under there and cause problems. You wanna have gloves on, you wanna have uh, applicator sticks that have wooden sticks to them and not just Q-tips with plastic uh, sticks. Uh, the last thing is a burnisher in the bottom left, an agate burnisher. And that's used uh, primarily just to press down the grain that's, that's raised after you've painted this onto the stick and it dries, it's going to feel a little rough. And so some, some coarse paper towels will knock it down a little bit and then the burnisher will uh, really enhance the quality of the finish. Now I'm mentioning all of this about nitric acid because this was the traditional method used in France. And it still is today, I believe. There are more makers, not a, not a majority of makers, but more than in the past, there are more makers who are just sunning their bows and uh, then just treating them with French polish. But to really to know the importance of nitric acid as it was in bow making hundreds of years ago also sets us up well for any restoration work that we're doing because if you're matching wood, you're going to need to know something about nitric acid. I have a sheet that I believe it is in the chat room. Jennifer was going to put it in the chat room for me, uh, materials needed. And it has on there sourcing for nitric acid and, and various other things as well. In the right-hand picture, this is what you need for a, a French polish. There are garnet shellac, shellac flakes in there in the mortar and pestle. I'm just crushing them up so that they'll dissolve a little bit sooner, a little bit easier. I have ethyl alcohol. Uh, it could be ethyl alcohol, it could be Everclear, which I believe is also ethyl alcohol, but not uh, available uh, in every state. Isopropyl, as long as it's 90% or, or more. Uh, and denatured alcohol would be the, the least favorite of all of those because of additives that are in, in the denatured alcohol that aren't quite so healthy for you. Right next to the alcohol is uh, camellia seed oil, which is what I'm using now. Originally, when I studied, I used either almond oil or walnut oil because those were the oils that were used traditionally in France. And uh, the camellia oil, I think, is just a, a beautiful finish on the bows. And so I have uh, shifted over to that almost exclusively now. In the front, there are squares of linen. It's linen that I've washed and it's softened, but it also uh, applies the French polish very cleanly. There's a sanding block and little pieces of 3M polishing paper. I have them cut up in little sections because you have to get in and do a shoe shine kind of thing in the, in the front of the head and the back of the head front of the frog, back of the frog. And I wanna keep my, my papers separate from frog and silver and then uh, Pernambuco so that I don't dirty up the Pernambuco. So the French polish 
preparation is to grind the flakes. And there are no preservatives in these flakes. So I always make just a very small amount in a jar. I add equal amounts by volume of uh, the flakes and alcohol and just let it sit until it dissolves. Stir it up every once in a while. Make sure that you're keeping the cover on the jar so that uh, you don't have all the alcohol disappear on you. At this point in time, here's something that's not traditional, but it, it is something that's being done uh, by many makers these days. And that's to just add a small pinch, just the tiniest little amount of ground up gum benzoin. And that will just give a little bit of extra shine to the finish, which I think uh, looks very lovely. If you do more than just a little pinch, it's going to look like plastic and it'll be very disappointing to you. Next slide, please. So here's the difference between whether or not you have treated the stick with nitric acid or whether you've just done the sunning and the French polish directly. Um, the nitric acid will, because of the density of the wood, stops right on the surface of the wood. And within just a few minutes of time, you have aged this wood by about a hundred years, just on the surface. So uh, your bow will have a very uh, older look. A lot of musicians love, love that because it is so traditional. Uh, the other way, for people who don't want to use nitric acid, don't want to have it in their shops, don't want to have it in their homes, don't want to take any personal risks with it, or just don't like the look of it, uh, you can sun it for as long as you want to sun it, and then you can go ahead and put your French polish on. To just step backwards for one moment to the nitric acid, there are times the, the, the amount of color, dye material in Pernambuco varies dramatically from stick to stick. And sometimes you'll have a beautiful stick and you treat it with nitric acid and it turns brown and it suddenly looks just like a cheap piece of uh, student bow wood, even though it's not. And if that's the case, then you can put it in a tube. Um, I don't know, Jen, did you pull up that that picture of the tube. It's a PVC pipe. It's a clear PVC pipe. The bow is suspended inside the pipe. And down at the very bottom of the tube is a small baby food glass jar with just a little bit of household ammonia, cleaning ammonia. Thank you, Jen. Um, that will bring out the redness uh, in the dye material. And so you can bring back the beauty of that color if you've lost it. There's no set amount of time that you would use uh, to put the bow in there. It can be, it can be two hours. It can be two days. You can just keep testing and looking at it and seeing if you're satisfied with it. And interestingly enough, you can even go back after French polishing and uh, still be able to pull up some color. It's really very, very beautiful. So you don't paint it on. It's just the fumes from this little jar at the bottom. And I have mine attached to my picnic table outside with some duct tape so it won't blow over, but I don't like to have the smell of those fumes inside. So nitric acid and ammonia I do outside on, on nice days. Next slide, please. I'm mentioning frog finishing here because it, in the stick finishing, where you take one small piece of linen, you put some of your uh, French polish, your shellac and alcohol mixture, put that inside, cover it over with a second piece and touch that with a dab of oil, and then just rub it onto the stick. None of that would be appropriate though on the frogs because what we don't want to do is to have these frogs get slippery in the hand. <clears throat> so it's very important that the frogs be finished, uh, also just finished with the 3M polishing papers or going through all the sandpapers and, and the polishing papers, uh, but no French polish at all. So it's a little bit of a matte finish. It's a lovely finish and it feels good in the hand. But uh, as a musician, I know that my hands get sweaty, especially if I'm playing Mozart and I've doing a lot of uh, squeezing to control the bow in the spiccatos. 
If that's the case, I want to be absolutely certain that I'm not going to send this bow flying off into the audience or crashing onto the floor. So no oil whatsoever. In the picture on the left hand side, you'll see that little teardrop shape up by my where my index finger is pointing. Uh, that's a little bit of the shape of the wood that I remove because that's where for violin, viola, cello, and French bass, that's where the thumb tip is going to be sitting. And the thumb tip is very, very easy to injure. There are a lot of nerve endings there. And unfortunately, there are a lot of careers that are impacted or even ended by damage in the hands. And so to be able to soften that edge not to change the shape, not to alter the shape, but just enough so that when you're putting your thumb tip there, uh, your, your hand is safe. In the right hand picture, on a German baseball, I do on the opposite side. So it's the same teardrop shape, but it's on the back side of the frog because the German bow is held up with the middle finger and that middle finger sits right there on that frog. Again, we're right on the tips of these fingers where we have a lot of nerve endings and we've got to be super careful not to not to create frogs that have such sharp edges that they're uh, causing pain. On the frog on the right hand side, well it's true on all frogs, I was taught to put a small one millimeter chamfer on every edge that the players are going to be touching. So it's not the side square to the back, square to the other side with sharp edges going down in between. It's really soft. It really feels good in the hand. And I think uh, as a player, I appreciate that. And as a maker, I know that my customers put the bows in their hands and just go, ah, oh, this feels so nice. Not, not worn in like somebody else's wear on the bow, but just something that they can work with and not have to work against. Just for your information, the one on the right-hand side uh, has a winding that is tinsel, which is silver wrapped around silk, very thin filament of silver wrapped around silk thread and black silk thread to make a design. And then uh, I think on this one, I used uh, Moroccan goat skin. Sometimes I used goat skin, sometimes uh, in various colors, black, brown, or green are the colors that I've been using recently. Um, and it's not necessary on a German bow because our hands don't go up there. So it's not, uh, you know, earlier uh, it was described that the, the winding and the leather were there to protect the stick. Well, not so on a German bow because we don't ever hold it up in that area. But I learned, and I think it's a valuable tool to always stamp my bow underneath the winding first. And I think that was something, I believe Sartori was the first person to do that. And I think he had a very practical reason for doing it because people were forging his bows and he was trying to uh, keep a record of his, his own original work. And so Sartori bows are stamped under there. And if you're going to spend a lot of money on a Sartori bow, you're going to want to check under there and see if that's the case. I like to put it under there because every single bow is going to be a little bit different, different in density. And I don't want to be stamping my name on the side facet and get it as I often do not quite hot enough or not evenly heated from one end to another or some something. I want to practice and I want to practice shot on that piece of wood. And so to be able to practice on the bottom facet underneath that winding on every bow uh, gives me that much better a shot of being able to uh, stamp it and uh, hopefully make it legible. And it'd be great if it looked beautiful. <laughs> they don't always. Next one, button finishing. This is my little on the left-hand side. This is my little Sherline metric lathe. And it's just invaluable. It, it's tiny, it doesn't weigh very much. And I can, um, I can do everything that I need to do on it. I just make my, all my buttons. Uh, on the German buttons, I just uh, put it into the 
chuck and off I go with 3M paper and oil. And that's the only finish. Again, no French polish on this. You don't want it to be so slippery that the player can't uh, tighten or loosen their bow. At the very tail end, the part that's in closest to the, not at the far end on the right, but the close up end on the left, uh, I like to soften that edge as well, because that's right where the button meets the stick. And it's really important that you don't have just a real hard ridge there. That would be sitting right in the that space in here in the middle of your hand between your thumb and your fingers. And that's that's distracting. You don't want to have that going on there. On the right hand side is just finishing up on a silver button. And uh, I would do it with sandpaper on a block. I don't want to have roundy edges on here. I want to have nice crisp edges so that I can turn it quickly and easily. And then I use a sanding block. I mean, a, uh, whew, what's it called? Buffing stick, a buffing stick with leather on it. The leather is face down on my bench, which is not such a good idea. I might be picking up some little, little pieces there that might scratch. Uh, the top right tube, uh, it doesn't have to be top right. Any kind of uh, jewelry, silver polish would be just fine. All right, next picture. So we get to the point where we've we've already figured out back back when we were making the bow, we had hair on it very, very early. And so we always check every step of the way to see about the weight and the balance and the strength. We don't want ever to have one of those Think, or be thinking about one of those without the other two. This bow that we're making doesn't have to just look good, but it has to really perform when we're finished. And so we have left in the consideration when we say, okay, great, the bow is graduated and now it's time to finish it. We've already taken into consideration the weight of the hair, the weight of the winding that we want to use for it, what we're aiming for at the final end, depending on what model we're using or what our customer is looking for. And so um, this is that point where it's, it's the end and you've done your final French polishing and then you stamp your name on there. And then you decide to put your hair on and you can decide which, which of the types of hair you would like to use or your customer would like to is used to using. And then you determine from that what the weight and balance needs are for this ind individual bow. And this one needed about two to three grams of weight. And so not a full silver winding that would have been too heavy. It would have pulled the weight back into the hand too much. So this was just, uh, just right with a little bit of tinsel and then two colors of silk. This is really important. And this is one of those, one of those time when the bow is this close to being finished. This is when I'm thankful that I have had an experience as a player because I, I always prefer making base bows to anything else because that's my expertise. That's where I've spent my life performing and it's where I can best analyze the bows. And so the hair goes on the bow and it has to be adjusted for whatever the seasonal uh, challenges are for length. And then I'm going to play on it on my own instrument. And I, I need to make sure that I'm getting an even tone from end to end. If there are any flat spots in there, any spots where this, where the, when I sit down and if it's out of straight, if there's anything about it that uh, looks problematic, even though I've been fussing with it and fixing the camber all along, I still need to do my final tweaking to make sure that when it gets in the player's hands, it's going to draw a perfectly even sound from end to end and not just die out. So I play it and I break in the hair. There's nothing worse than sending a bow off to, or bows off to players 
with fresh hair on them because then they start blaming the bow for not uh, not responding properly when really it's just that the hair hasn't been broken in properly. So I do all that breaking in myself just to avoid those kinds of moments. And then I usually send two or three bows to people. I live in Maine, so most of my clients are spread out around the country or around the world. They, they don't live here in Maine, so I'm shipping most of my bows. And I like people to have a selection. So uh, COVID gave me an opportunity to really sit down at my bench without the orchestra playing. I had extra time at the bench to make inventory. And so now when someone calls, I can say, perfect, I have two bows to send you or three bows to send you. That gives them an opportunity to really feel the differences between the bows, which one is better suited for them. They have a selection and that really matters, but also how it fits on their instrument, how, how it performs on their particular instrument. I do guarantee the bows so that if someone buys a bow, this is particularly important because I do sell a lot of bows to uh, conservatory students. Uh, they might be changing schools, they might be changing teachers, they might be changing instruments. And it's very possible that what worked for them two years ago might not be working so well on their new instrument or on, on, with their new increased technique. And so I always take my bow back in trade, assuming it's in good condition. And I, it, it seems that it is most often in good condition. Um, I'll take it back for the whatever they paid for it and trade towards another bow so that I don't have, I never sell through shops. I sell directly to the musicians because I want to communicate with them and I want them to be happy. If they're not happy, I want to know about it. And I either want to be able to adjust a bow by changing the weight or balance or making sure I get that bow back and uh, making sure that they get a bow that really works for them. So that's a little bit about how I run my business as well. Just to step backwards, that's, that's the end of my slides. I wanted to just step back for a moment and just go over the French polishing because a, a coat goes on and it, it used to be the, it used to be in France that bows were made very quickly not a lot of time was spent on this French polishing process. A coat of French polish would go on and then they would wait a day and then they would push it down with something. I don't know always what they were using, pumice perhaps or rotten stone would be good guesses. And then another coat, same thing with the pumice or the rotten stone. And then by day three, they were really ready to put the hair and the winding on it, stamp it, get it out the door. And that was just the way it was handled back in those days. It almost always filled the pores of the head, but it didn't do much more than that. It was assumed, and it's certainly true, that when bows are rehaired and they're cleaned regularly and French polished regularly in the cleaning, in the rehairing process, uh, that the, the patina builds up over time on those bows, but that originally three coats was about it. And uh, so it's, it's really important these days to give it a little bit more than that. So three coats will most 90% of the time will fill the pores in the head. But if you can go beyond that and put on another coat or two, I think it just gives it that little extra something that it's not so shiny that you can't see the beauty of the wood through it. We don't want that kind of a gloss but it just uh, it goes beyond just the, the filling the pores and gives it a very, very beautiful finished look. So that's it for me, if anybody's got any questions. Great. Thank you very much, Lynn. That was very insightful and very useful. Thank you very much. We've got two questions. Oh, could, could I just jump in first before that? Uh, I showed that picture of me playing the bows and if there's, if there's something in that camber or straightening that I need to fix, because I have already French polished it at that time, I always use something called Menzerna, M-E-N-Z-E-R-N-A. I always use it. I have a block on my bench and I rub it on the wood. I have a block of it right here. I rub it on the wood 
<laughs> and it will uh, protect the wood from scorching. It's very valuable to have. And uh, I have it here, I, be it, but, mm, I buy it in big blocks and then I bandsaw it off in chunks. So just let me know if you, if you want some of that, but it will, it'll really protect the sticks. And that's going to be true of not just your own sticks, but that's going to be true of any bow that you're cambering or straightening. Okay, now questions. Thank you. And I hadn't realized I didn't have my microphone so on. <laughs> so the first question, <laughs> what, what difference is there when you use nitric acid and when you use ammonia? And this is if you just, from yeah, if you just use the ammonia, if you just said, oh, I don't really like the sound of that nitric acid, I think I'm just going to go straight to the ammonia, your stick will turn purple. And that's not a very pretty sight. It's not a pretty purple. It's, uh, it's a very gaudy purple. So if you're going to use the ammonia, you have to use the nitric acid first and then determine whether or not you really need to, that extra step of the uh, the ammonia as well but i would never use it just on a bare stick fantastic thank you and yeah. the second question is from uh, kirby um is this polishing paper you're recommending different than micro polish she relies on them a lot when uh, and would like to improve her ability to get into the tiny nooks uh, the 3m polishing paper i think it's also on that sheet that jen put up um, hold on just a second. I have it here. 3M flexible polishing paper, and it goes from 400 to 8,000 grit. It's really extraordinary. You can water wash it and use it over and over and over again. And uh, it's just, the finish is just incredible. It's beautiful. I used micro mesh for years and years and years until I saw this. And once I, once I tried this once, I was hooked on it. Perfect. We have time for more questions and there is more. Um, so we've got from Cecilia Gonzalez. When you work with nitric acid, you, uh, I understand, do you apply it with a brush? And how do you stop the reaction afterwards? Is there a danger in terms of possible damage to the structure of the wood? There is no damage to the structure of the wood, which is extraordinary. It has been used, it has been experimented with in violin making, and it created a beautiful amber color but uh, it, it did after 20 years or 25 years uh, begin to deteriorate the wood. That's not so in Pernambuco. And there must be chemically, there must be a base in this wood that, uh, that stops the action of, of the acid. Because even if you have a, a bow that comes in where the head breaks off and you need to spline it, you'll just see a fraction of the dark color around the edges. It never travels in, it never follows the grain in. It stops immediately. And so you, you put it on with just that Q-tip, that small Q-tip, put it on. You may end up with some lap marks, but they, they go away over the course of time. And then you just let it sit until it's thoroughly dry. And when it is thoroughly dry, then you can touch it with your bare hands. There's no danger to your hands at that stage. So that tells me that something has uh, neutralized that acid. But then from that moment on, then it's just sort of, it's a rough finish and you have to use the agate burnisher and the, the rough paper towels to, uh, to push that down a little bit before you go ahead and put your French polish on. Fantastic, thank you very much, Lynn.